Woe to you of earth and sea. Welcome to Satan is My Superhero, a show for atheists, scoffers, heathens and unbelievers. I'm your host, Judas Falling. In this episode, we deep dive into the mother of all conspiracy theories, the flat earth, where science denial alone is nowhere near enough cognitive dissonance to keep the belief alive. Cognitive dissonance, come rescue me. This is a deep state cover-up that predates the very actors that are covering it up. It goes back at least 2,500 years and has been perpetuated and hidden from the world by quite literally billions of people. It would require as many people in on the conspiracy as are being fooled. It's easy to understand how pre-seafaring civilizations may have believed the Earth was flat. You could be forgiven for assuming that flat Earth theory is ancient and it is the round Earth theory that is new, but you would be wrong. The flat Earth movement is only a couple of hundred years old. From early antiquity onwards, as sailors moved away from hugging the coastline to open sea, the horrible truth of a spherical Earth became hard to deny, as previously unseen land masses would begin rising out of the horizon upon approach. Captain, there is an island directly ahead of us, growing out of the ocean. I can they see anything. Number one, have the wine rations to the crow's nest. Pythagoras has often been touted as the first to put forward the idea of a spherical Earth in the 6th century BCE, but this is contested. It may well have been observed earlier than him and then developed as an idea in his school, perhaps even after his death. Actually, it's an oblate spheroid flattened at the... You know what? Forget it. I forget I said anything. I just, I just hurt myself and I don't want to be that guy. Don't be that douche. The first written account of a spherical Earth comes from Greek philosopher Parmenides in the 5th century BCE. It seems Parmenides was not so much putting the idea forward as a new thing, but merely discussing a common belief. After providing observations of star positions in different parts of the world, and also noting Earth's shadow during lunar eclipses was always circular no matter the angle, Aristotle stated in his book, On the Heavens. All of which goes to show not only that the Earth is circular in shape, but also that it is a sphere. Another little-known Greek philosopher called Plato also wrote about the Earth being a round body. Interestingly, history has failed to record any notable opposition to this idea. Obviously, there would have been doubters, but they were not able or willing to record the dissent, or no one bothered keeping accounts of it. Bring me that refutation of Pythagorean theory about the spherical nature of Earth. Are we going to transcribe it into a new piece of papyrus? It is getting a bit ratty, or does a great scholar want to quote parts of it in a new work? Nope, we're out of toilet paper. In the 3rd century BCE, Archimedes, who admittedly was a bit obsessed with spheres, laid down the framework for Newton in his discussion of the waters of the Earth enveloping this giant sphere, all drawn to the same gravitational centre. Captain, we've been rowing for three days now, and the horizon hasn't gotten any closer. Ah no, it's so weird. We should have reached the edge of the world by now. Archie's come up with a theory. Aye, yes. What if the world were a sphere? That's impossible. All the water would fall off. Well, no. Not if the gravitational centre was in the middle of that sphere. Everything would be pulled into the centre equally. In fact, that gravitational centre would not only sustain the sphere, but would actually be responsible for its creation and shape. Do ye have any idea how ludicrous you sound right now? Or could it be we've been cursed by an evil wizard and the horizon will always be the same distance from us? Finally, a sensible explanation. All right, let's head home. But the curse? Plan B, kill Archie and eat him. By the first century CE, Eratosthenes and Posidonus had worked out the circumference of the planet to an accuracy of within 15%. They were not trying to prove the spherical shape of the Earth. That was a finished debate. They were merely trying to work out how big the planet was. The idea promoted in Western civilization by the Greeks was not derived from divine inspiration and delivered to them in fever dreams. They came to the conclusion through observation and experimentation. The idea did not die with antiquity. It continued to be accepted fact by later thinkers like Cicero, Pliny the Elder, Claudius Ptolemy, Strabo, Seneca just to name a few. 
Early Christian writers were forced to deal with the fact that their Old Testament Hebrew scriptures seemed to describe a flat earth and some passages in the New Testament made assertions incompatible with a round earth. And here is where history begins recording the first arguments against a round earth. In the 3rd century CE, Lactantius argued against a spherical earth when he wrote... Is anybody so foolish as to believe that there are men who have their feet above their heads, that grain and trees grow downward, that rain and snow fall upward? It makes you wonder if there were similarly naive views held in the Antipodes. According to my calculations, if people do indeed live at the top of the world, It would not appear very different from here except for three things. Water would vortex in the opposite direction while going down a drain. Likewise, cyclones would spin in the opposite direction and when they threw a stick, it would not come back. The boomerangs don't come back? That must be very annoying. Yes, I imagine it turns some of them white with rage. Many, if not most, influences in the early church smart enough to know they were playing a long game were not willing to go against easily provable fact and were happy to ignore the question. In the 4th century, Basil of Caesarea did exactly that when he wrote, If it be spherical or cylindrical, if it resembles a disc and is equally rounded in all parts, or if it has the fourth of a winnowing basket and is hollow in the middle... All these conjectures have been suggested by cosmographers, each one upsetting that of his predecessor. It will not lead me to give less importance to the creation of the universe. Some were more willing to openly argue against Lactanius. St Ambrose of Milan and St Augustine would both write about the round earth, although Augustine doubted the existence of Australians. It is impossible that there should be inhabitants on the opposite side of the earth since no such race is recorded by scripture among the descendants of Adam. That's only because the original manuscript wasn't complete. Quickly, scribe, write this down. Uh, And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad uh, begat uh, Mehuyael, and Mehuyael begat uh, Methusael, and Methusael begat uh, Lemach, and Lemach begat Bruce. Did you get all of that? I'm sorry, Moses. I ran out of goat skin at the end and missed Bruce. You know what? It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. No one's seen Bruce since he fell off the edge of the world. In the 6th century, Cosmas the Monk published Christian Topograph, in which, based on his extensive travels and reading of scripture, forcefully argued the earth was indeed flat. He vehemently attacked his fellow Christians who had so easily accepted the ideas of the pre-Christian Greeks. The famous sphere of the pagans does not harmonize at all with what Christian doctrine proclaims, but is adapted rather for those who hope neither for a resurrection of the dead nor for another state after it, but assert that the whole world is an endless process of generation and corruption. That's exactly what life is. Despite the blip of Cosmos, throughout the so-called Dark and Middle Ages, leading lights in Christianity like Bishop Isidore of Seville and the Venerable Bede would continue to roll with the round earth being fact. In the 16th century, as you would well know, Magellan's fleet circumnavigated the globe, not to prove the world was round, but to open a western trade route with the Spice Islands of Indonesia for Spain and avoid the Portuguese-controlled eastern route. For all intents and purposes, any debate about a flat earth was now completely ridiculous. Or at least, that's what everyone thought. Let's go, boys! I'm going to take a short break from the show right now to talk about my sponsors and Patreon. I don't currently have sponsors or Patreon, but if you'd like to support the show, you can do that by buying my novel. It's called Chaos Machine by Judas Forley. It's available through Amazon. You don't need a Kindle to read it. Almost any digital device will do. Don't forget, Chaos Machine by Judas Falling. Now, back to the show. While it's certainly plausible that a large portion of the unwashed masses probably did think the Earth was flat for most of history, it's not until the 19th century that the flat Earth movement begins. 
Interesting parallel to the internet, it seems to me no coincidence that as literacy among the general population increased, so did the propagation of these types of fringe theories. At the tender age of 21, Englishman Samuel Robotham joined a utopian society situated on the long, straight Bedford Canal. Robotham caused so much disruption in the socialist commune of Owenites that they voted to throw him out. He forced his way back in at gunpoint. Not a joke. But was eventually evicted once and for all, and no one got shot. Mummy, no one wants to be more friend. Did you point your pistol at them? Yeah, and they still won't be my friend. Well, there must be something wrong with them. During his time in the cult, sorry, commune, Robotham claims to have carried out a number of experiments using boats with flags and strategically placed telescopes along the Strait Canal to prove the Earth was flat in 1839. But Robotham's first foray into the public sphere was in 1842 when he published a 64-page pamphlet entitled An Inquiry into the Cause of Natural Death, or Death from Old Age and developing an entirely new and certain method of preserving active and healthful life for an extraordinary period. According to Robotham, old age was merely a hardening of the body caused by what he described as earthy matter. The 26-year-old Robotham claimed, I have had 320 of the most severe and obstinate cases under my care. The plan of treatment has been to put the patient upon a particular diet, one consisting of articles as free as possible from earthy matter, and to administer certain combinations of the tartric, nitric, and hydrochloric acids to dissolve what I conceive to be the matter which obstructed the system. And in no case where this has been attended to has it failed. Hmm, I would have thought he'd be more famous having cured old age. I'm interested in your youth retaining elixir. But how do I know it works? Just look at me. How old do you think I am? Hmm. Mid-twenties? I'm 47. No way! Well, that would have made you the right age to have fought in the Napoleonic Wars. What regiment were you in? Um, the 60th? Oh, so you served directly under the Grand Old Duke of York himself? What was he like? Um, well, you know, he marched us up to the top of the hill and then now you know he marched us down again. What was the point of that? Um, well, uh, when we were up, we were up, and when we were down, we were down. But the genius of the old man was that when we were halfway, we were neither up nor down. I don't get it. What does it mean? It means you should just buy the damn elixir. Robotham would continue promoting his quackery and selling patent medicines for the rest of his life, but he didn't stop there. In 1849, building on his 1839 experiments on the Bedford Canal, he began giving lectures denouncing the spherical nature of Earth and published a 16-page pamphlet. Zetetic Astronomy, a description of several experiments which prove that the surface of the sea is a perfect plane and that the Earth is not a globe. Using the stage name Parallax, Robotham toured the UK throughout the 1850s and became very famous. Some have suggested by the end of the decade he was a household name. In 1865, he published his 221-page Magnus Opus based on his earlier pamphlet, but with a catchier title. Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe. Here, Robotham would rely on the same old scriptural arguments others before him had used. But the innovation Robotham brought to the debate would establish the template for round-earth denial still used today. He developed the commonly held view of the Earth as a disk with the North Pole being in the centre surrounded by the continents and Antarctica being an impenetrable ice wall that surrounds the disk, keeping all the water from falling off. Oh, I wonder what's on the other side of the ice wall. White walkers and wildlings, I expect. He would claim that ships disappearing over the horizon is merely a trick of perspective, and with a strong enough telescope you would see those ships all the way to the edge of the world. This claim is as strong today as it was in the 19th century, but flat earthers now, as then, have an aversion to actually looking through the lens. So, can you still see the ship? Totally. Really? Everyone else who looked through the eyepiece agree. The ship is gone. I can still see it. Okay. I've actually organised with the captain to raise a flag once they got over the horizon. Just tell me what colour the flag is. Um, well, um, oh, um, did did I tell you, I'm actually colourblind, so, uh, yes. Among Robotham's arguments was information he had scrutinised in a reference book called Lighthouses of the World, 
First published in 1862, it gave detailed descriptions and locations of over 2,000 lighthouses. Importantly, this book also noted the greatest distance the lighthouse could be observed from. Of the 2,000 listed lights, Robotham uncovered 30 that could be seen from a distance that should have been beyond the horizon if, indeed, the world were round. He did the calculations for over 2,000 lighthouses? What a boring fellow. Of course, he did not calculate for or possibly even know about light refraction. He also did not account for some of these 30 cherry-picked data points being incorrectly documented in his source material. Robotham would also claim to have fired a gun perfectly straight up in the air and... On discharging the gun, the ball invariably during several trials descended within a few inches of the gun. Twice it fell back upon the very mouth of the barrel. Don't try this at home. But Mr. Robotham, isn't there a chance the projectiles will land on our heads? Don't worry. That's what the tinfoil hats are for. Owner of one of the lecture halls Robotham made these claims at, A.J. Dyer, demanded Robotham perform this experiment for him and offered to pay five shillings for every ball that landed back in the barrel. Dyer would write, The twenty bullets were propelled from the gun, but in place of invariably descending within a few inches of the gun, or back into the place of their detachment, as stated by Parallax, they fell in all directions and from 10 to 20 feet from the gun. Turns out the safest place to stand was right next to the gun. Robotham also argued water, for the most part, stands still and flat. How could this be possible on a spinning globe? Illustrious modern philosopher and former cricketer Andrew Freddie Flintoff wondered the same thing in 2017. Why if we're hurtling through space, why would water stay still? Why is it not wobbling? I wonder if Mr. Flintoff has ever been served a refreshing beverage while sitting in the first-class section of a modern airliner. Would you like a coffee, Mr. Flintoff? No, I would not. We're doing 800 kilometres per hour. It'll fly out of the cup that's got my beautiful face. Well, we're travelling at a constant rate of velocity, so that won't happen. What are you talking about? It's called inertia. Inertia? I've never heard of that brand of coffee. I think Dyer's quote can best sum up what any thinking person feels about the whole flat earth phenomena. I have now examined every question of any scientific importance in the book entitled Earth Not a Globe, and in doing so, my patience has often been sorely tried. The great number of dogmatic assertions, the incorrect statements, the suppression of facts, and the misrepresentations found in his pages have more than once tempted me to throw the book into the fire. This model of dogmatic assertions, incorrect statements, suppression of the facts and misrepresentations still accurately describes the flat earth propagandists of today. After Robotham's death at the age of 68... Are you saying his cure for old age didn't work? Robotham disciple John Hampton would write... The Zetetic or Socratic Society and Biblical Defense Association has earned the everlasting gratitude of every independent truth seeker and Christian professor by its detection and exposure of that satanic device and pagan blasphemy of a round and revolving globe. You know, originally I was going to try and convince you the Earth was penis shaped, but then it occurred to me testicles are just funnier. Hey, I'm going to take a quick break from the show to talk about the novel Chaos Machine by me, Judas Falling. I know for some people, science fiction has a reputation for being dry and filled with descriptions of future tech designed to give geeks hard-ons. Chaos Machine is very definitely not that kind of book. It's a character-driven novel filled with humanity, murder and betrayal. But don't just believe me, check out this five-star review on Amazon. The world that Falling has created is well-developed with strong characters and a storyline that keeps you swiping the page. Yes, it's violent, with blood, gore and semen. Now be honest, when have you ever heard the word semen used in a review for a science fiction novel? By buying the book, you'll be supporting the show, which we will now return to. In 1885, William Carpenter, who had taken Robotham's Flat Earth Theory to the US, published his book... 100 Proofs That the Earth Is Not a Globe... I'm not going to get bogged down with Carpenter's ideas. He brings nothing new to the cause, but rather just affirms his hero Robotham's views. 
but I will give you a flavour of the man from the introduction to the book. Dr. Samuel B. Robotham finished his earthly labours in England, the country of his birth, December 23, 1884, at the age of 89. As already mentioned, Robotham was 68. I don't understand. He didn't look a day over 70. Oh, it seems Carpenter drank all the Kool-Aid. Carpenter is a good writer and sells his deceptions with gusto and conviction. 100 Proofs is a worthy companion piece to Robotham's work and is still referenced today. But back in the 19th century, Hampton, Carpenter and the other Robotham apostles lacked his charisma and oratory skills. Even Robotham's harshest critics admitted he was a master debater. The movement would continue, but losing momentum every year after. They chose to play smaller, more intimate venues. Inside Christian fundamentalism, however, it continued in small pockets. In his 1901 book, Terra Firma, The Earth Not a Planet, Proved from Scripture, Reason, and Fact. After stating the standard flat Earth trope that he can't feel the motion of the so-called planet, David Wardlow Scott wrote, I can only account for the delusion as having been introduced by Satan. And it is exhausting. Preacher Wilbur Voliva, who vehemently preached flat earth theory, had his own radio station in the 1920s and was a precursor to the modern televangelists. Voliva dominated an evangelical community set up in the town of Zion in Illinois. Voliva would preach, There is a heaven right up there, and between this earth and heaven where God's throne is, in the upper air are evil, wicked, lying spirits, and down below is hell. Believer would eventually be brought down to earth by his own evil, wicked, lying spirit. In the middle of the Great Depression in 1931, he told Time magazine as CEO of Zion Industries he was personally worth 10 million In 1933, Time would report on his bankruptcy proceedings. For two years, 5,000 Zion employees had received no regular paychecks. Mr. Voliva, I haven't been paid for three months. Well, as you know, there is a global depression right now. We've all had to tighten our belts. In the executive lounge, we've started serving domestic wine. In 1956, Dover sign writer Samuel Shenton created the International Flat Earth Research Society. What Shenton brought to the dwindling movement was a step away from scripture and into full-blown conspiracy theory. As the space race heated up, he was convinced both Russia and the USA wanted us to believe the Earth was round for reasons he could never really explain. I can't live with the lie anymore. I'm going to tell the whole world the truth about the flat earth, space, everything. I want to tell these truths not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We talked about this, John. This is how we siphon money out of treasury. I know, but it's time to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, and if not us, who? And if not now, when? Okay, but can you at least give us some time to prepare for the fallout? I mean, for a start, we have to let the Russians know. Okay, I'll make the announcement as soon as I get back from Dallas. Great idea. Who knows? Maybe a nice drive in the Texas sun will clear your head. Howdy, it's the Reverend Steph here. Most of the music in this episode was supplied by the comedy disco punk band The Genuine Hoots of Joy. If you want to hear the songs in their entirety, check out Hoots of Joy on YouTube. You might recognise the lead singer. Uh, 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 okay, it's, uh, it's me. After Samuel Shenton's death, the International Flat Earth Research Society was taken over by Charles Johnson. Johnson believed world governments were keeping the Flat Earth a secret and had almost come clean about it after World War II. He claimed in a 1980 interview, After the war, the world will be declared flat and Roosevelt would be declared the first president of the world. When the UN Charter was drafted in San Francisco, they took the Flat Earth map as their symbol. Johnson claimed his Flat Earth Society had 3,500 members but lost all the records in a 1997 house fire. Charlie, the house is on fire! Grab a fire extinguisher! Fire extinguishers are a hoax. They're just filled with mind control gas to make you hallucinate that you put out the fire. Then call the fire department! 
It's the fire department who start most fires to justify their existence. Oh, well, at least insurance will cover it. Insurance? I don't have insurance. Oh, why not? Is it a Jewish Freemason lie to steal money? No, I'm just a cheap bastard. Once again, the movement stagnated until 2004 when Daniel Shenton, no relation to Samuel, brought the Flat Earthers to the interwebs with flatearthsociety.org. The hearts of a whole new generation of conspiracy theorists skipped a beat. And it is here that the Flat Earth movement rolls into a new but sadly familiar dark arena for regular listeners of this show. Oh, it's going to be Nazis, isn't it? I can tell by the way you said familiar. Always with the Nazis on this show. You should change the name of this podcast to Nazis are my... Well, okay, that's not going to work, but you know what I mean. In the next episode of this trilogy of ironically circular thinking, we will examine how this seemingly harmless pastime for dummies has become one of the most pernicious and evil conspiracy theories going. For now, I will leave you with this quote from Cosmos the Monk. For the pagans who think that there is a sphere, in consequence neither acknowledge a resurrection of the dead, nor say that the dead ascend into heaven. Yes, Cosmos, that's right. The earth is a sphere. The dead aren't resurrected, and no one ascends into heaven. And that's why Satan is my superhero. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, subscribe, you know the drill. But more importantly, please recommend this show to just one person. I mean literally one person. Choose that person well. Why haven't I done Scottish before? He works really well. Yes, and this still... I just read the line above that. But I don't know what their accent went A northern. I'm interested in your youth routine in the lakes. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try again. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Mr. Robottom. <laughs> Robottom. Mr. Robottom. Charlie, the house is on fire. Grab a fire extinguisher. <laughs> I'm just going to be me. I don't know what voice will come out.